Chapter 10. To be great, concentrate. Let everyone ascertain his special business and calling, and stick to it, Franklin. He who follows two hares is sure to catch neither. None sends his arrow to the mark in view, whose hand is feeble or his aim untrue, Coper. He who wishes to fulfill his mission must be a man of one idea, that is, of one great overmastering purpose, overshadowing all of his aims and guiding and controlling his entire life. Bait. The shortest way to do anything is to do only one thing at a time. Cecil. The power of concentration is one of the most valuable of intellectual attainments. Horace Mann. The power of a man increases steadily by continuance in one direction. Emerson. Careful attention to one thing often proves superior to genius and art. Cicero. It puffed like a locomotive, said a boy of the donkey engine. It whistled like the steam cars, but it didn't go anywhere. The world is full of donkey engines, of people who can whistle and puff and pull, but they don't go anywhere. They have no definite aim, no controlling purpose. The great secret of Napoleon's power lay in his marvelous ability to concentrate his forces upon a single point. After finding the weak place in the enemy's ranks, he would mass his men and hurl them upon the enemy like an avalanche until he made a breach. What a lesson of the power of concentration there is in that man's life. He was such a master of himself that he could concentrate his powers upon the smallest detail as well as upon an empire. When Napoleon had anything to say, he always went straight to his mark. He had a purpose in everything he did. There was no dilly-dallying nor shilly-shallying. He knew what he wanted to say and said it. It was the same with all of his plans. What he wanted to do, he did. He always hit the bullseye. His great success in war was due largely to his definiteness of aim. He knew what he wanted to do and did it. He was like a great burning glass concentrating the rays of the sun upon a single spot. He burned a hole wherever he went. The sun's rays scattered do no execution, but concentrated in a burning glass, they melt solid granite. Yes, a diamond even. There are plenty of men who have ability enough. The rays of their faculties taken separately are all right, but they are powerless to collect them to concentrate them upon a single object. They lack the burning glass of a purpose to focalize upon one spot the separate rays of their ability. Versatile men, universal geniuses are usually weak because they have no power to concentrate the rays of their ability to focalize them upon one point until they burn a hole in whatever they undertake. This power to bring all of one's scattered forces into one focal point makes all the difference between success and failure. The sun might blaze out upon the earth forever without burning a hole in it or setting anything on fire, whereas a very few of these rays concentrated in a burning glass would, as stated, transform a diamond into vapor. Sir James McIntosh was a man of marvelous ability. He excited in everybody who knew him great expectations, but there was no purpose in his life to act as a burning glass to collect the brilliant rays of his intellect, by which he might have dazzled the world. Most men have ability enough. If they could only focalize it into one grand, central, all-absorbing purpose to accomplish great things. To encourage me in my efforts to cultivate the power of attention, said a friend of John C. Calhoun, he stated that to his end he had early subjected his mind to such a rigid course of discipline and had persisted without faltering until he had acquired a perfect control over it, that he could now confine it to any subject as long as he pleased, without wandering even for a moment that it was his uniform habit. When he set out alone to walk or ride, to select a subject for reflection, and that he never suffered his attention to wander from it 
until he was satisfied with its examination. My friend laughs at me because I have but one idea, said a learned American chemist. But I have learned that if I wish ever to make a breach in a wall, I must play my guns continually upon one point. It is his will that has made him what he is, said an intimate friend of Philip D. Armour, the Chicago millionaire. He fixes his eye on something ahead, and no matter what rises upon the right or the left, he never sees it. He goes straight in pursuit of the object ahead and overtakes it at last. He never gives up what he undertakes. While Horace Greeley would devote a column of the New York Tribune to an article, Thurlow Weed would treat the same subject in a few words in the Albany Evening Journal and put the argument into such shape as to carry far more conviction. If you would be pungent, says Southey, be brief, for it is with words as with sunbeams. The more they are condensed, the deeper they burn. The only valuable kind of study, said Sidney Smith, is to read so heartily that dinner time comes two hours before you expected it. To sit with your Livy before you and hear the geese cackling that saved the capital and to see with your own eyes the Carthaginian settlers gathering up the rings of the Roman knights after the Battle of Cannae and heaping them into bushels, and to be so intimately present at the actions you are reading of that when anybody knocks at the door, it will take you two or three seconds to determine whether you are in your own study or on the plains of Lombardy, looking at Hannibal's weather-beaten face and admiring the splendor of his single eye. Never study on speculation, says Waters. All such study is vain. Form a plan, have an object, then work for it. Learn all you can about it and you will be sure to succeed. What I mean by studying on speculation is that aimless learning of things because they may be useful someday, which is like the conduct of the woman who bought at auction a brass door plate with the name of Thompson on it thinking it might be useful someday. I resolved when I began to read law, said Edward Sugden, afterward Lord St. Leonard, to make everything I acquired perfectly my own and never go on to a second reading till I had entirely accomplished the first. Many of the competitors read as much in a day as I did in a week, but at the end of 12 months, my knowledge was as fresh as on the day it was acquired while theirs had glided away from their recollection. Very often, says Sidney Smith, the modern precept of education is, be ignorant of nothing. But my advice is, have the courage to be ignorant of a great number of things so that you may avoid the calamity of being ignorant of all things. Lord, help me to take fewer things into my hands and to do them well, is a prayer recommended by Paxton Hood to an overworked man. Many persons, seeing me so much engaged in active life, said Edward Bulwer Lytton, and as much about the world as if I had never been a student, have said to me, when do you get time to write all of your books? How on earth do you contrive to do so much work? I shall surprise you by the answer I made. The answer is this, I contrive to do so much work by never doing too much at a time. A man to get through work well must not overwork himself, or if he do too much today, the reaction of fatigue will come and he will be obliged to do little tomorrow. Now since I began really and earnestly to study, which was not till I had left college and was actually in the world, I may perhaps say that I have gone through as large a course of general reading as most men of my time. I have traveled much and I have seen much. I have mixed much in politics and in the various businesses of life. And in addition to all of this, I have published somewhere about 60 volumes, some upon subjects requiring much special research. And what time do you think, as a general rule, I have devoted to study, to reading, and writing? Not more than three hours a day. And when Parliament is sitting, not always that. But then, during these three hours, I have given my whole attention to what I was about. The things that are crowded out of a life are the test of that life. Not what we would like, but what we long for and strive for with all our might we attain. One great cause of failure of young men in business, says Carnegie, 
is lack of concentration. They are prone to seek outside investments. The cause of many a surprising failure lies in so doing. Every dollar of capital and credit, every business thought, should be concentrated upon the one business upon which a man has embarked. He should never scatter his shot. It is a poor business which would not yield better returns for increased capital than any outside investment. No man or set of men or corporation can manage a businessman's capital as well as he can manage it himself. The rule, do not put all your eggs in one basket, does not apply to a man's life work. Put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket is the true doctrine, the most valuable rule of all. A man must not only desire to be right, said Beecher, he must be right. You may say, I wish to send this ball so as to kill the lion crouching yonder, ready to spring upon me. My wishes are all right, and I hope Providence will direct the ball. Providence won't. You must do it, and if you do not, you are a dead man. The ruling idea of Milton's life and the key to his mental history is his resolve to produce a great poem. Not that the aspiration in itself is singular, for it is probably shared in by every poet in his turn. As every clever schoolboy is destined by himself or his friends to become Lord Chancellor, and every private in the French army carries in his haversack the baton of a marshal, so it is a necessary ingredient of the dream of Parnassus that it should embody itself in a form of surpassing brilliance. What distinguishes Milton from the crowd of youthful literary aspirants, all du Javanta, is his consistency of resolve. He not only nourished through manhood the dream of youth, keeping under the unfortunate instincts which carry off most ambitions in middle life into the pursuit of place, profit, honor, the thorns which spring up and smother the wheat, but carried out his dream and its integrity in old age. He formed himself for this achievement and no other. Study at home, travel abroad, the arena of political controversy, the public service, the practice of the domestic virtues were so many parts of the schooling which was to make a poet. Bismarck adopted it as the aim of his public life to snatch Germany from the Austrian oppression and to gather around Prussia in a North German confederation. All the states whose tone of thought, religion, manners and interests were in harmony with those of Prussia. To attain this end, he once said in conversation, I would brave all dangers, exile, the scaffold itself. What matter if they hang me, provided the rope with which I am hung binds this new Germany firmly to the Prussian throne. It is related of Greeley that when he was writing his American conflict, he found it necessary to conceal himself somewhere to prevent constant interruptions. He accordingly took a room in the Bible house, where he worked from 10 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon and then appeared in the sanctum, seemingly as fresh as ever. Cooper Institute is the evening school which Peter Cooper, as long ago as 1810, resolved to found someday when he was looking about as an apprentice for a place where he could go to school evenings. Through all his career in various branches of business, he never lost sight of this object. And as his wealth increased, he was pleased that it brought nearer the realization of his dream. See a great lawyer like Rufus Choate, says Dr. Storrs. In a case where his convictions are strong and his feelings are enlisted, he saw long ago, as he glanced over the box, that five of those in it were sympathetic with him. As he went on, he became equally certain of seven. The number now has risen to ten, but two are still left whom he feels that he has not persuaded or mastered. Upon them, he now concentrates his power summing up the facts, setting forth anew and more forcibly the principles, urging upon them his view of the case with a more and more intense action of his mind upon theirs, until one only is left. Like the blow of a hammer, continually repeated until the iron bar crumbles beneath it, his whole force comes with ceaseless percussion on that one mind till it has yielded and accepts the conviction on which the pleader's purpose is fixed. Men say afterward, he surpassed himself. It was only because the singleness of his aim gave unity, intensity, and overpowering energy to the mind. 
The foreman of the jury, however, said Whipple, was a hard-hearted, practical man, a model of business intellect and integrity, but with an incapacity of understanding any intellect or conscious radically differing from his own. Mr. Choate's argument, as far as the facts in the law were concerned, were through in an hour. Still, he went on speaking. Hour after hour passed, and yet he continued to speak with constantly increasing eloquence, repeating and recapitulating without any seeming reason, facts which he had already stated, and arguments which he had already urged. The truth was, as I gradually learned, that he was engaged in a hand-to-hand, -hand, or rather in a brain-to-brain, and a heart-to-heart -heart contest with the foreman, whose resistance he was determined to break down but who confronted him for three hours with defiance observable in every rigid line of his honest countenance. You fool, was the burden of the advocate's ingenious argument. You rascal, was the phrase legibly printed on the foreman's incredulous face. But at last the features of the foreman began to relax. And at the end, the stern lines melted into acquiescence with the opinion of the advocate who had been storming at the defenses of his mind, his heart, and his conscience for five hours and had now entered as victor. The verdict was not guilty. He who would do some great thing in this short life must apply himself to the work with such a concentration of his forces as to idle spectators who live only to amuse themselves looks like insanity. It is generally thought that when a man is said to be dissipated in his habits, he must be a drinking man or a gambler or licentious, or all three. But dissipation is of two kinds, coarse and refined. A man can dissipate or scatter all of his mental energies and physical power by indulging in too many respectable diversions as easily as in habits of a viler nature. Property and its cares make some men dissipated. Too many friends make others. The exactions of society, the balls, parties, receptions, and various entertainments constantly being given and attended by the beau monde constitutes a most wasting species of dissipation. Others, again, fritter away all their time and strength in political agitations or in controversies and gossip. Others in idling with music or some other one of the fine arts others in feasting or fasting as their dispositions and feelings incline. But the man of concentration, of purpose, is never a dissipated man in any sense, good or bad. He has no time to devote to useless trifling of any kind, but puts in as many strokes of faithful work as possible toward the attainment of some definite good. End of chapter 10. Oh, 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 o